Chapter Eleven of Armand Durand by Rosanna Le Proen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Paul, as usual, made but a short stay, and his purchases for the invalid and the house completed, he turned his horse's head homewards the following day on armand's expressing a wish to return with him to see his sick father it was hastily vetoed by paul who insisted that the fact of his son's leaving his studies would only annoy and fret him a thing to be carefully avoided in his present suffering state two letters that our hero wrote home shortly after paul's visit remained without an answer beyond a few hurried lines from the latter announcing that their father was a little better then came a letter from durand himself containing a great deal of solemn warning both from father and aunt regarding the danger of ill-chosen acquaintances much formal advice about the necessity of profiting of time with some plain hints about the expense of his support in town and in answer to his question of whether he had not better run down into the country for a few days to see them he was briefly told to remain where he was and profit of his opportunities all this deeply wounded armand who was really guiltless of having done anything to deserve it and his own letters home grew colder briefer and fewer characteristics which now plainly marked all the family epistles he received in return with the exception of occasional bulletins from paul which however kind in spirit contained very little beyond a mention of their father's health and of the irritating change his rheumatic sufferings had wrought in his usually placid temper together with some dry details regarding the farm or stock determined not to brood if he could help it over these painful changes our hero studied went out when invited and occasionally though very rarely when unable to refuse without giving absolute offence joined the noisy merry-makings of l'esperance and his friends these details for want of other matter he frequently mentioned in his letters to paul to whom he spoke very unreservedly even telling in one case how l'esperance had borrowed money from him which he had no hopes of ever having repaid paul's answering epistles soon became of a nature to invite these confidences more fully for he often repeated how much such amusing letters enlivened the monotony of the long dull evenings at home and how well he enjoyed such graphic descriptions of town life and its pleasures of delima lorrain armand spoke rarely a dawning interest in the young girl excited far more by her evident partiality for himself than by her beauty induced a shyness on the topic which made him generally avoid it in reality there was very little to write about a quiet evening at cards or draughts now and then a carriole drive with her and mrs martel on rare occasions or a dreamy long talk beside the large double stove through whose chinks the fire shone redly on cold winter nights such was the extent of their intimacy and mrs martel's absences from the room which occurred with the frequency suggestive at times of design never caused a tone in his voice to vary or won a tenderer look towards his beautiful companion armand might not have been so indifferent had not another face wayward proud charming often risen mentally before him steeling him in a great measure against all other influences the carnival was very gay and as durand was better so at least paul wrote armand enjoyed without scruple the harmless social pleasures within his reach he occasionally met miss de beauvoir at some of the more recherche of these entertainments and sometimes enjoyed the rare privilege of a dance with her during which she was always gracious and friendly in the extreme singularly enough every one of these meetings had the effect of rendering him insensible for weeks after to de Lima's charms within the last week of the festive season came an intense longing to visit home even if his presence were unwished for there and on shrove tuesday the closing day of the carnival he set out for alonville 
when he came in sight of home evening was closing in and he eagerly looked towards the comfortable old farmhouse expecting to see it cheerfully lighted up for lent that season of fasting and penance had been from time immemorial ushered in within its substantial walls by feasting and mirth one light now alone faintly twinkled from the sitting-room window but nothing discouraged he pushed on supposing it was rather early yet for general lighting up a process usually deferred in the country till the latest possible moment from economical motives on arriving he left his horse to the care of the overjoyed old farm servant and without farther warning than a short rap he entered the sitting-room anything but festive or cheerful did it look by the light of a candle burning on a small table near her mrs ratelle was sewing whilst paul durand was seated in a large chair one limb swathed in flannel and supported on a stool his head resting on his hand in gloomy silence on seeing armand his aunt francoise hastily rose and affectionately greeted him but his father generally quiet and undemonstrative was unusually so on the present occasion indeed the coldness of his greeting chilled the impetuous warmth with which his son sprang towards him and whilst wounding the young man deeply imparted a reserve to his manner and conversation which the father noticed at once and inconsistently enough chafed at the conversation dragged on heavily there were some sarcastic fears that he would find a visit to the country very dull after his gay town life and a querulous doubt as to the necessity or wisdom of young men studying professions unless where there was stability of character here armand earnestly asked but why do you say that with such emphasis father on what ground am i to be condemned for want of steadiness well son your own letters to paul for the last few weeks which he has regularly read to us may have given rise to the idea was the dry rejoinder but was there anything forbidden anything really wrong told in them this much boy they spoke of little else than mirth feasting and gaiety when the old father whose willing hand furnished money for joining in all this merriment was lying utterly forgotten by you on a sick-bed a prey to severe suffering and discouragement armand half rose to his feet but mrs ratelle interpreting aright his indignant look with a warning entreating glance towards the invalid's swathed limb and the medicine bottles at his elbow interposed brother paul you must not be too hard on our boy tis very difficult for a young man to live like a hermit in a gay city paul wrote to me that you were better father and when i wished some weeks ago to come to see you grieved anxious as i was about your ailing health i was curtly informed by letter that you wished me to remain where i was and not lose my time i did say so once and paul wrote to you that i was better out of kindness ah he is a son to be prized a staff for my old age what would have become of me of the farm of us all if he too had taken to law or physic up early and late at work from morning till night no party going oyster suppers or white kid gloves for him my hard-working industrious boy he makes money instead of spending it deeper grew the flush on armand's cheek as his father continued in this strain and he was on the point of breaking forth despite his aunt ratelle's beseeching looks into hasty rejoinder when the entrance of paul effected a diversion matters however did not grow much smoother and the kind efforts of tante francoise and the excellent supper she provided failed to impart anything like cordial cheerfulness to the little circle or to banish the irritability that marked durand's manner why did you show my letters abruptly asked the elder brother as they sat together in paul's bedroom after the family had separated for the night because i did not think there was any harm in doing so i supposed they would have amused father instead of annoying him 
if i had kept them to myself he might have supposed there was something terrible in them i scarcely know him he is so changed moodily resumed armand what does it all mean age and rheumatism was the curt reply don't think i escape without my share of fault-finding when anything goes wrong even to the bolting of a stable window you should hear him poor paul ejaculated armand the faint gleam of suspicion that had flashed across his mind vanishing at once it must be hard to bear it was long past midnight before the elder brother fell asleep for he was rendered additionally restless and wakeful by the heavy breathing of paul but the latter following the time-honoured rule of early to rest was also early to rise and when armand who had slept unusually late came downstairs he was told that breakfast was long since over and paul gone out an hour before on his farm tour why did not paul awake me he asked because he knew you were not used to the hardships of early rising returned his father and there was a dry sarcasm in his tone that irritated the young man as much as it pained him aunt ratel soon placed an excellent breakfast before him but his appetite was not keen and after a few minutes spent over the meal chiefly employed in answering dry questions propounded to him by his father regarding the progress he was making in his law studies the hopes he had for the future he sprang up and approached the window though near the middle of march a fierce snowstorm was raging and as he looked forth at the bleak scene before him what can be drearier than a country landscape in a snowstorm he felt there was a strange sympathy between it and the aching dreariness filling at the moment his own breast another cold question from his father followed by a petulant reply from himself which in turn drew forth a sarcastic remark and his resolution was taken yes he would return to town at once the chill wintry air would be more endurable than the new and strange atmosphere of unkindness that had suddenly filled his once happy home his intention of leaving so soon and in such weather was warmly opposed by his aunt ratelle but durand perhaps influenced by pride offered little opposition on bidding him farewell however a sudden softening in his voice and manner almost tempted armand to throw off all reserve and frankly ask what had chilled the deep love that had once reigned between them and rendered their intercourse such a happy one but the fear of a repulse of being openly told what he secretly dreaded that it was the expense he entailed on his father which rendered the latter so reserved and irritable prevented him after our hero's return to town he betook himself to the daily routine of life as diligently but in a less joyous frame of mind than previously letters from home were rarer and as unsatisfactory as ever whilst he in turn wrote but seldom and then generally addressed himself to paul one pleasant afternoon that he looked unusually dull mrs martel good-naturedly insisted on his going out for a walk as he had confined himself greatly to the house and office of late and please mr durand will you kindly oblige me by bringing my poor delima with you for a walk she wants a little fresh air as much as you do yourself industrious hard-working little creature that she is she never thinks of taking any rest armand without any great professions of interest or delight briefly answered in the affirmative and old mrs martel smiling and exultant hurried off to tell her cousin to dress looking very charming in a simple but graceful toilet the lima soon fluttered downstairs and armand with some brief word of courtesy opened the little gate for her to pass out suddenly mrs martel appeared in the doorway and breathless from the speed with which she had hurried downstairs conjured delima to call at her cousin vizina's to borrow the pattern of her new cap tis rather far hesitated miss lorraine where is it 
questioned armand near the pied de courant hochelaga oh that is very far he replied twill fatigue miss laurin too much not at all hastily interrupted mrs martel delima is a good walker no distance can tire her and i particularly want my new cap for sunday please oblige me mr durand well if you insist and miss delima thinks she is equal to it i am willing and without farther parley the young couple set off the walk was pleasant enough and they arrived at mrs vezina's as fresh as when they started the cap was willingly lent and then hospitality offered they must wait for a cup of tea delima's timid fear that it might detain them too late and armand's suggestion that a glass of milk or cider would be equally welcome as it would permit them to start on their homeward way immediately were resolutely resisted the merits of the cup of tea were enhanced by hot cakes and other delicacies the preparation of which took considerable time so when the feast was over and delima rose to put on her hat armand instead of giving an approving thought to the dainty fare lately spread before him was impatiently speculating on the lateness of the hour and the stupidity of mrs martel in sending them such a distance in the evening they immediately started for home and the twilight was fortunately soon replaced by a remarkably clear brilliant moonlight perhaps rendered nervous by the comparative lateness of the hour delima tripped a couple of times so her companion felt bound in common courtesy to offer her the support of his arm as they walked on two lonely figures in the long dusty road she occasionally looking up to him with that timid appealing look which becomes some women so well the noise of wheels broke on the stillness and a carriage came driving slowly towards them the occupants two ladies and a gentleman were closely scrutinizing our pedestrians and suddenly armand with a pang of inexpressible mortification discovered that they were mrs de beauvoir and her daughter with victor de montenay in reply to his low bow two of the party nodded coldly but gertrude's face was slightly turned aside and in the clear full moonlight he could plainly see it looked cold and haughty as if made of marble how he chafed at the unlucky chain of circumstances that had led him into his present position mentally apostrophizing mrs martel in terms anything but complimentary including the fair delima herself in the condemnation in vain the latter looked up more winningly than ever into his face in vain the soft pearly light added a deeper lustre to her splendid eyes a spirituelle beauty to her sculptured features armand saw thought only of that cold averted face which had worn for the first time towards him a look of hauteur who were those ladies in the carriage timidly inquired his companion breaking a long silence mrs and miss de beauvoir he curtly rejoined unable to disguise a certain lurking irritation in his voice but we must walk faster miss laurin tis growing very late little more was said on either side armand was in no mood for talk and delima richly dowered in beauty was not greatly so in mind or conversational powers arrived at home our hero with the briefest possible answer to mrs martel's smiling welcome hurried past her into his room did he speak she asked in an eager whisper of her cousin as they stood a moment in the little entrance nothing to the purpose rejoined the girl tears of mortification glittering in her eyes heavens what a flinty heart he must have and mrs martel elevated her hands and eyes as she spoke but keep up your courage my delima i courted my worthy old husband in there fully six months before he condescended to make love to me in return and yet see how much he thinks of me now and what a happy couple we are but are you hungry little one i have some nice head cheese and a slice of good home-made cake in the cupboard for you 
yes i will eat a morsel for i scarcely touched anything at aunt vezina's with mr armand's eyes watching me bah do those fine gentlemen think that because a girl is pretty and delicate looking she is to live like a bee on honey or flowers thank goodness my delima is able to eat food that can at least nourish her come now to the cupboard and then off to bed for you must feel tired after your long and profitless walk End of chapter 11chapter twelve of armand durand by rosanna le proan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary a fortnight had elapsed without armand's hearing from home but they were all such negligent correspondents there the event caused him no great uneasiness once had he met miss de beauvoir since the unlucky evening walk he had taken with delima and instead of the smiling friendly bow with which she had ever favoured him she passed with the faintest possible nod of recognition this unusual severity bewildered poor armand surely he had not deserved it he little knew that de montenay had whispered some short time previous to mrs de beauvoir some discreditable remark regarding his friendship with the pretty de lima of whose beauty he had heard lavish praises from rodolphe belfond mrs de beauvoir by no means particular or prudish had repeated this piece of gossip to her daughter whom it both shocked and pained the moonlight meeting with armand and his fair companion at so late an hour on a lonely road had wonderfully confirmed it and gertrude with a bitterness she could not explain to herself resolved that all farther friendship indeed civility between herself and armand should be at an end the latter was sitting at his desk one evening his head bowed on the volume open before him not however studying any professional problem but wondering whether miss de beauvoir would ever smile on him again and whether her present coldness was merely the result of caprice or of a settled determination when a loud tap at his door and belfond's cheerful how are you awoke him from his reverie after a short while the latter abruptly said why what is the matter with you old fellow twice have i called lately and each time have found you in the blues are you in love or in debt which is it neither rejoined armand with a forced smile my life is too quiet to give me a chance for either i don't know that and belfond shook his head dubiously la belle petite in the next room has half turned my head and i've seen her only a few times how then must it be with you domiciliated under the same roof with her our hero faintly coloured thinking how fortunate it was that his friend's suspicions did not point to gertrude and after a moment's silence belfond abruptly said with tone and look more serious than he had yet assumed the best thing you can do is to come with me for a while to st etienne my mother wrote this week entreating a visit and insisting that i should bring some friends with me i came here to ask you and will take no refusal you are very kind belfond but not another word or you will confirm me in my opinion that miss de lima has already so strong a hold on your affections that you cannot leave her even for a few days you have only to-morrow for preparation wednesday morning we must be en route armand who retained a very pleasant recollection of the affability and good breeding of the mrs belfond gratefully assented feeling that he wanted some change to aid in dispelling a certain discouragement and listlessness that was beginning to steal over him and which he had scarcely the will much less the strength to resist true they might be angry at home about his absenting himself from his studies but the sense of injustice under which he smarted made him for the time indifferent to praise or blame that evening at tea he carelessly announced his intention of leaving for a short time and he was somewhat surprised not to say embarrassed when delima rose from the table in evident agitation and left the room mrs martel hastily followed and after a pause spent by armand and his host in staring at each other the latter said philosophically 
we may as well begin or everything will be cold do you pour out the tea mr armand and i'll put in the milk and sugar when mrs martel shortly after re-entered the room which she did with a face of unusual solemnity she found them freely helping themselves to hot toast and cold roast beef wife where is la petite this was mr martel's usual name for delima ill and low-spirited groaned the hostess glancing first solemnly towards the ceiling and then indignantly towards her husband who was just helping himself to another round of toast perhaps the apple dumplings we had at dinner have disagreed with her i thought them rather heavy myself if you had not been so busy with them and your knife and fork andre martel you would have seen that she never touched them rejoined the incensed matron darting a withering glance towards her spouse whilst he unconscious of having incurred her wrath continued his meal with a hearty appetite soon after armand expressing a polite regret for miss de lima's illness rose from table oh she'll be better this evening mr durand and i think if you could drop in for an hour's chat it would cheer her up said his landlady i would do so willingly but i have some papers to finish copying and i have to write home to tell them where i am going mr armand durand you have a heart as hard as a millstone exclaimed mrs martel softly but angrily apostrophizing her lodger as the door closed upon him indeed wife i think him a very quiet kind young gentleman and husband i think you a thick-headed dunce so now that we have each had our say hand over what is left of the toast andre knowing that his wife's fits of ill-temper were usually of short duration complied with unruffled equanimity and harmony was soon restored pale and depressed delima came to table next day but our hero was too much preoccupied to bestow on her the amount of sympathy which mrs martel doubtless thought so fair a face deserved a vague fear too that he was in some measure connected with the young girl's illness or melancholy made him shrink from the very subject and when she put her hand in his to say good-bye the morning of his departure he felt intensely grateful to his landlord for standing quietly smoking in the passage during the parting unconscious alike of armand's gratitude or of his wife's concentrated wrath at his want of tact which harmlessly exploded in the kitchen a few moments afterwards when he went in search of her armand was no flirt he was also too honourable to encourage a young girl in a feeling of affection to which he might never be able to respond and which whilst occasionally gratifying his self-love had in reality left his heart untouched life at st etienne where the belfond family resided was very delightful a constant round of harmless gaiety filled up the time and picnics excursions by land and water interchange of visits with neighboring families succeeded each other uninterruptedly armand was quite a favorite with his entertainers principally because rodolphe the pride and hope of the family was so fond of him and mrs belfond whose clear penetration had divined the moral worth of her son's friend encouraged in every manner their intimacy two or three young ladies from town were also guests but miss de beauvoir was not among them the hostess had written herself to invite her but gertrude replied that she had promised her uncle mr de courval to remain some time at alonville she would accept later on armand's calling one afternoon at the village post-office to inquire for letters a small note was handed him the writing though irregular and evidently disguised was decidedly feminine and inwardly hoping it was not a new phase of delima's low spirits he opened it and read armand durand how can you give yourself up so entirely to idle gaiety when your good and loving father lies on his deathbed hasten home at once or you will be too late there was no signature not even an initial 
but a sudden presentiment that the writer spoke truth blanched the reader's cheek to deathly paleness and he resolved to leave for alonville that very afternoon nay that very hour should it prove a hoax a visit home would be no hardship should it be truth but that supposition was too terrible on it he would not even permit himself to dwell on his return he briefly informed the family that he had received news from home which obliged him to leave immediately and some hours after he was on his way two days rapid travelling brought armand to his journey's end and he alighted at the old homestead almost sick with anxiety and dread the outer door was half open and he hastily entered sitting-room and hall were empty but there were signs of disorder about that usually well-kept abode that struck a deeper chill to his heart a forgotten candle guttered slowly down in a strong draught from an open window a footstool overturned lay beside a chair on which a bowl had been carelessly left and cloaks and shawls lay across the stair railing his secret terror growing deeper and deeper he hurried up the stairs and stood breathless at his father's bedroom door which was wide open his worst fears were realized in that dimly lighted room surrounded by weeping friends and neighbors paul durand pale and with closed eyes lay back on his pillow the damps of death gathering on his brow its purple hues around his mouth agonized desperate losing for the moment all self-control armand sprang towards the bed and flinging himself on his knees beside it almost screamed forth o oh god it cannot be father father you are not dying slowly durand opened his heavy eyes and looked at his son the countenance of the latter distorted with mental agony ghastly pale even as that of the dying man spoke eloquently of passionate anguish and when in a fresh outburst of delirious sorrow he loudly asked why was i not called to your sick-bed told of your danger a smile beautiful as a ray of sunlight stole over the wan face of durand child of my genevieve he faintly whispered and as armand bowed his head on his father's breast in answer to that appeal the latter feebly strove to caress his wavy hair my god i thank thee for this crowning mercy his pale lips faltered armand could not trust his voice to speak and a short silence followed suddenly a look of inexpressible distress disturbed the heretofore calm countenance of the dying man and in a voice broken and almost unintelligible he gasped the will the will armand my son see to it one quick glance the elder brother darted towards paul whose eyes fell guiltily beneath his and then he soothingly rejoined do not be anxious father dear about it we will arrange all for the best a look of relief then of happiness again stole over durand's face but speech was failing fast and he whispered pray one of the neighbors took up a prayer-book and with a broken voice read aloud prayers suitable to the occasion after a while durand's lips moved his eldest son bent closely over him and distinguished the one word genevieve it was the last paul durand spoke in this world and shortly after his spirit passed away when the eyes of the dead had been reverently closed and farther prayers read armand rose from his knees and left the room closely followed by mrs Rattel. kiss me my poor unhappy boy she said as she entered with him into the comfortably furnished bedroom he had always occupied with paul since they were children and drew him towards a seat sit down here and tell me why you did not come home to us sooner rather tell me he asked with a fierceness strangely out of keeping with his usual gentleness of character rather tell me why i was not asked to come why that sneaking treacherous paul did not write to me yes he did write to you twice and i wrote once but no reply came have you been absent from town lately 
yes i have been spending a few days at mrs belfond's in st etienne but i wrote word home i was going there and left strict orders with my landlady to forward to me any letters that should arrive for me in montreal something must be wrong then for we have not received a letter from you for a considerable time past tis a riddle that must be solved rejoined armand sternly i fear some treachery has been at work hush do not say that implored mrs ratelle paul might hear you but before he joins us i have a few things to tell you which it would be better for you to hear from me than from any other go on kind tante ratelle i am listening but tante ratelle did not find her task apparently an easy one for she hesitated then with a desperate effort faltered you must know your poor father was very much pained by your continued absence as well as silence when we had written twice to tell you of his serious illness which we did whenever we feared that rheumatism was about attacking his heart news came to us through some indirect channel that you were feasting and enjoying yourself at st etienne and yesterday morning my poor brother irritated by your supposed ingratitude and indifference sent for the notary and and oh my poor boy and here the speaker fell on his neck weeping you are disinherited penniless calmly armand spoke then my brother paul is sole heir yes apart from a thousand pounds left myself which i accepted merely with the intention of making them over to you a thing i will do without any delay no no good tante they were not intended for me and i do not want them very bitter indeed has my return home proved but one ray of light brightens its gloom my father died in my arms blessing me and thinking of my mother thank god that she gave not birth to the traitor who undermined me in my father's love go down now dear tante francoise you will be wanted below and i long for a half hour's solitude knowing her presence was indeed necessary for superintending the last sad preparations she silently pressed her nephew's hand and went downstairs resolved to keep paul occupied below so as to prevent the brothers meeting till armand's excited feelings should have a little calmed down the latter left alone sprang to his feet and commenced pacing the room in one of his hurried uneven movements he overthrew an old-fashioned leather portfolio which had always lain on the table and as he stooped to raise it and the contents which had scattered in falling his eye rested on a sealed letter addressed to himself in his aunt's well-known writing he tore it open it was a short and urgent appeal to him to lose no time in repairing at once to his father's deathbed adding that the latter was constantly asking for him ah good brother paul he muttered between his clenched teeth the riddle has been quickly solved this is why the letters never reached me what a reckoning lies before us grasping the epistle in his hand he resumed his beat his eyes constantly turned towards the door longing for his brother's entrance that he might give vent to the passion surging up within him armand was in a dangerous frame of mind just then men less exasperated than he was have wrought murder under its influence he dimly foresaw that wrath would entirely get the better of him that paul was hot-blooded and violent and what the result of an altercation between them would be no human foresight could tell still he was determined that an explanation should take place that very evening indeed that very hour if paul entered the room at length the door-handle turned and armand's heart gave a bound ah here he is at last the household traitor no it was not paul but mrs ratelle she looked eagerly towards her nephew hoping to see a more tranquil look on his face but instead its angry excitement had deepened and the wrathful brightness of his eyes had increased my boy my armand i had hoped to have found you calmer is this of a nature to make me calmer aunt francoise and he held towards her the letter that had fallen from the portfolio this is the summons you sent me to come quickly to bid my father a last farewell 
brother paul did not see the urgency of the case and detained it as he has of course done the others but he will account quickly to me for all and as i momentarily expect him i would rather tante francoise have no witness to our interview you will be welcome in this room at all other times as you wish dear armand but first you must come with me to see your poor father in his shroud i have sought you for that purpose do not fear meeting paul there i have sent him on a message mutely assenting armand followed his aunt through the passage to the room now hung with sheets and lighted with wax tapers where lay the mortal remains of paul durand the solemnity but none of the repulsiveness of death was there for the stalwart farmer looked as if he were quietly sleeping the look of suffering had passed from his face and his regular features were calm and placid aunt and nephew knelt one on each side of the bed and as the latter suddenly raised his face now softened and grief-stricken in expression with eyes full of tears mrs ratel reached across and clasping his hand placed it over the still breast of the dead armand my child i who have replaced to the best of my ability the mother you lost so early ask you now by her sainted memory as well as by the love which this true heart on which your hand and mine are now resting bore you through life to forgive the wrongs your brother has done you aunt Ratel, you ask too much and armand vainly strove to withdraw his hand from the firm fingers that retained it in that sacred resting-place not so if these poor icy lips could speak what would they say armand you dearly loved your father and despite the little estrangement that reigned of late between you you were his favourite son tis because i loved my father i would avenge myself on him who through a series of plotting and treachery undermined me in that father's love but at the last who did your father cling to armand armand harden not your heart against my prayers against the mute entreaty of those rigid lips and this pulseless heart which can only appeal to you now by their mute immovability even as i am now praying to you armand so would he have prayed implored you to forego a vengeance which in its unhallowed strength may mean fratricide murder young durand powerfully affected bowed his head and then whispered i promise heaven will bless you my armand for that word i know that you will regard a promise made in this solemn presence sacred as an oath ah that is paul's step on the stairs thank god i need not shrink in terror from his coming as i would have done a short half hour ago be true my armand to your word the door opened and paul entered as his glance fell on his brother he involuntarily recoiled then advanced a step or two and said with much embarrassment of manner this is a sad meeting for us armand another hour and you would have arrived too late yes robbed alike of my father's blessing as of my inheritance paul durand you owe me a heavy debt and he held up the intercepted letter but i have promised beside our dead father to cancel it paul's swarthy cheek became ashen gray and he muttered indistinctly something about having accidentally forgotten the letter alluded to even as the others were forgotten retorted armand bitterly however i am pledged to peace so farther discussion is useless the world is wide and henceforth you will go your way and i mine the one thing necessary is that our roads should forever lie far apart something like compunction awoke in paul's selfish heart and as his dark cheek flushed he faltered armand that need not be my father has left plenty of means and i will be willing to share with you you will not find me as selfish or grasping as you think how little you know me if you imagine i could accept help or favour from you after that past which will for ever lie as a gulf between us here mrs ratel hastily interposed dreading the turn the conversation was taking paul you must absolutely go to bed now 
for the last three nights you have faithfully watched beside your poor father to-night armand and i will replace you alas that our vigil should be so hopeless a one paul ill at ease in his brother's presence yielded to this proposal and aunt and nephew were again left alone after some farther prayer and silent reverent thought mrs ratelle beckoned her companion to a seat beside her in a far corner of the room and there in a low subdued tone recounted to him the brief episode of his young mother's wedded life she glossed over nothing not even her own energetic disapproval of the young wife's housekeeping shortcomings and then she spoke of paul's mother her moral worth and the conscientious tender care she had always bestowed on her young stepson as armand listened to these bygone reminiscences glancing ever and anon at that quiet bed and its shrouded occupant he felt more and more convinced that mrs ratelle's intervention had been mercifully ordained and he thanked god that he had listened to her prayers instead of the promptings of revenge the dreary days preceding the funeral and the still drearier one of the last sad ceremony itself passed over and then armand made his preparations to return to montreal at once he and his brother had rarely met during the interval and then they had merely exchanged nods each felt the presence of the other a painful restraint that evening as armand was returning from a visit to his father's grave he saw coming towards him a slight elegant figure the first glimpse of which set his heart in violent motion it was gertrude de beauvoir and quick as thought the conviction flashed across him that she was the writer of the few anonymous lines that had summoned him so mysteriously to his father's deathbed so she probably thought him a heartless unnatural son turning from the most sacred appeals of affection to listen but to the voice of pleasure or dissipation it was too hard that he should lie under the weight of her censure her contempt when he was really undeserving of either so he would despite the tumultuous throbbings of his heart accost her and clear himself his courage almost failed him as he approached her she looked so elegant so stately but with an effort he made her a profound bow which she returned by a slight nod of recognition so frigid that he involuntarily drew back growing desperate however in his intense anxiety to right himself in her estimation he again drew near but as he exclaimed good evening miss de beauvoir she abruptly haughtily turned from him never had armand experienced so galling so bitter a sense of mortification as at that moment how he reviled reproached himself for his folly what had he in common with this elegant capricious beauty that he should have exposed himself so stupidly to her contumely what cared she whether he was worthy of praise or blame he the unknown law student permitted to enter on sufferance her uncle's drawing-room even had she written him the anonymous note he had received at saint etienne it was probably nothing but the result of sudden whim of woman's caprice as if to fill the measure of his humiliation to overflowing his glance suddenly fell on de montenay who had been advancing across the fields and now bounded lightly over the fence alighting beside gertrude in the mocking malicious expression of his face as he slightly nodded to armand the latter saw that he had witnessed and enjoyed the mortifying repulse he had just received and solacing his sore and wounded feelings by giving a dead cut in return for victor's insolent bow he turned away though not before he had seen the latter raise a flower that had just fallen from the bouquet miss de beauvoir held in her hand and after gallantly pressing it to his lips place it in his breast ah loving him of course she hates me soliloquized our crestfallen hero what am i farmer durand's son in comparison with the heir of the de montenays fool fool what madness have i been laboring under for some time past well i am cured of it now and forever 
depressed beyond measure he returned to the house and stole up to the spare room the one he had occupied since his last arrival at home and there threw himself wearily on a chair feeling as if life had nothing worth living for in came tante francoise to coax him down to tea but he alleged a bad headache as excuse for declining then she touched on his plans and a considerable amount of discussion ensued on learning that armand was contemplating giving up the study of law and endeavouring to obtain a place as clerk in some store or counting-house her indignation knew no bounds indeed he was almost stunned by the voluble reproaches she poured forth taxing him with ingratitude to the memory of father and mother and indifference to the family honour on armand's reminding her that he was now thanks to his brother's treachery left without means beyond whatever he might earn by his own exertions she impetuously urged on his acceptance the legacy left herself would i ever have taken it had it not been that i intended it for you i would have flung it back to my brother first irritated as i was by the injustice of his will after a prolonged almost angry discussion it was settled that armand should continue the study of his profession using carefully meanwhile for his maintenance the interest of the legacy mrs ratelle yielded to paul's urgent request that she should continue to live in the old homestead and direct it till as she curtly told him he brought home a wife an event which might happen in a week for all she cared with an aching heart armand durand left the home of his boyhood of which paul was now sole master feeling in all probability he should never cross its threshold again adding a sharper pang to the thought of the cruel injustice and treachery of which he had been the object rose on his recollection the disdain with which miss de beauvoir had turned from him and from the explanations he had so earnestly wished to make to her yes it was all dreariness together and he longed to get back to his dry legal studies hoping to bury in their dull details every other thought or remembrance old mrs martel's reception of him was cordial in the extreme but even in the first flush of congratulation and sympathy there was a mysterious allusion to some special reason which caused her to rejoice doubly over his arrival little by little extracting from him all the while strong promises of secrecy she at last revealed the fact that her poor little cousin was breaking her heart about mr armand she cared nothing for the latter's fine gentlemen friends who had so often flattered her nor for the two wealthy young farmers of st laurent who had vainly tried to win her no her love was for armand alone remembering the remarks made by rodolphe belfond shortly after delima's arrival regarding her evident preference for himself our hero though no fop saw nothing improbable in mrs martel's revelation there was something soothing in it also to his self-love which had been so pitilessly wounded by miss de beauvoir's haughtiness and something so consolatory to the affections which had been so ruthlessly outraged by paul's falsehood and its result yes there was one heart at least that beat true to him and the thought of delima in her fresh young beauty grieving praying living but for him a strong sentiment of gratitude of that pity which is akin to love took possession of him ah her feminine gentleness would never have allowed her to outrage even an enemy's feelings as that high-born beauty had done his but fearing his silence might be misinterpreted by his companion he hastily commenced i cannot tell you dear mrs martel how unhappy the information you have just imparted makes me this is more especially the case owing to my father's will which has left me penniless i cannot think for years to come of marrying mention this to miss laurin and she will at once see the inutility of wasting farther thought on my unworthy self mr durand replied his landlady with dignity delima loves yourself not your fortune 
and i feel assured she will rather rejoice than otherwise at a circumstance affording her an opportunity of showing her disinterestedness ah hers is a noble nature that i fully believe but let us hope that you have mistaken her sentiments alas i have not interrupted mrs martel solemnly i have only too good cause to know the truth of what i say but thank god you are back the very knowledge will do la pauvre petite good that day a few hours later armand entered the sitting-room where delima looking all the better for a certain pallor and look of languor sat on the little sofa a pretence of needlework in her slight fingers she coloured deeply as armand entered and to his intense vexation he felt that his face crimsoned also the interview was a most embarrassing one to both from the mutual efforts made to conceal that embarrassment but armand soon recovered his self-possession and then what a bewitching little listener he had to whatever scraps of narrative he chose to give her what tender sympathy shone in those soft varying eyes what timid admiration lurked in those downcast modest glances ah a most dangerously charming invalid was delima and an older head than that of armand might have yielded to her subtle influence still he struggled manfully against it and the wily arts of mrs martel who in her way was almost as formidable an adversary as delima herself without the former's able generalship matters would have never gone farther than a sentimental friendship between the young people but the elder lady was determined it should not rest at that in answer to her energetic appeal one day that she had entered his room on some trifling errand that he should take pity on her cousin and speak some words of encouragement he abruptly rejoined but have i not told you mrs martel that i am a beggar say not so mr durand whilst you are rich in the possession of a heart like delima's listen to me you will marry the poor child and live with us we have no children so there will be plenty for us all armand impatiently sprang to his feet but the remembrance of the soft tearful eyes that had looked so sadly at him that morning whilst their owner informed him of her intention of returning to saint laurent as her health was getting worse instead of better enabled him to conquer his momentary annoyance mrs martel continued at intervals in the same strain armand pursuing his rapid promenade through the narrow room and then he abruptly entered the sitting-room where delima was sitting looking listlessly from the window of course his hostess did not follow him there and the lapse of an hour found him still lingering beside that slight girlish figure when they parted they were affianced lovers true he had hesitatingly acknowledged that he feared he did not love her as she deserved to be loved as indeed he felt he was capable of loving but had she not with touching gentleness whispered that it would be her aim her study to win him to do so yes she was surely all that a man's heart could wish for and yet as armand pressed the kiss of betrothal on her cheek a sudden remembrance of gertrude with her patrician grace so fascinating despite her coldness and haughty reserve flashed upon him and substituted a dull pang of pain for the rapture with which that hour should have been fraught mrs martel with an energy that fairly appalled armand and against which he vainly protested hurried on affairs as rapidly as possible and shortly after one dull overcast morning at the early hour of six armand durand and delima lorrain were united till death should them part there was no ceremonious wedding breakfast and pretty bridal gifts no gathering of friends and acquaintances to wish them joy mrs martel fearing family interference had extorted a promise from armand that he should not write home before the event was over and he knowing well how unwelcome the information would prove willingly assented of course there was a dainty breakfast spread to welcome them on their return from church 
of course mrs martel was all smiles and felicitations and the lovely bride herself all blushes and fluttered happiness still perhaps it was the dim gray light of an overcast day a faint shadow rested at times on the bridegroom's handsome face which he vainly strove to conceal would the young girl at his side aid in dispelling or deepening it was a question the answer to which lay hid in the dim misty recesses of the future End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of armand durand by rosanna le Proen. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary lamps were lighted and curtains drawn early in the comfortable drawing-room of the manor-house at allonville for the evening was wet and windy and leaning thoughtfully back in the depths of the largest and softest of easy-chairs sat gertrude de beauvoir a strip of embroidery on her lap wools and canvas on the table beside her and books and newspapers at her feet betokened she had turned from one employment to another without finding much interest or amusement in any her reverie was interrupted by the entrance of victor de montenay who apparently undisturbed by the coldness of his reception he had by this time grown accustomed to her wilful ways drew another easy-chair towards her and seated himself have you heard about the latest marriage he questioned after a short exchange of commonplace phrases no well that very handsome clever good-for-nothing armand durand has at last married the pretty little sewing-girl with whom he has been flirting so long the speaker bent a covert penetrating look on his companion but she stooped even whilst he spoke to raise a fashion-plate that lay at her feet and when he again caught a glimpse of her face it was calm as that of a statue the news does not seem to interest you much gertrude why should it i know him very little her not at all let us turn then to topics nearer home when is our own marriage dearest to come off i am sure i have no idea except that it will not be for a long time and she half closed her eyes as if the topic wearied her but that is not a just or generous answer to my question it is really the best i have to give he angrily pushed back his chair and said gertrude it is time to have done with childish folly time to ratify at the altar the engagement between us think how long and faithfully i have waited bearing all the while with your indifference and caprices be just now and to answer me the answer i fear will not be a pleasant one victor do not insist on my giving it but i must have it i cannot i will not be put off any longer from month to month from year to year i entered this room to-night resolved not to leave it without an explicit definite reply since you will have it so i will speak frankly then i fear that you and i are too dissimilar in sympathies and opinions to permit us ever to be happy together gertrude you are not serious you are surely only saying this to try my patience as you so often do for once no was the rejoinder i was earnestly reflecting on the subject when you entered and thinking how i could best make my determination known to you de montenay sprang to his feet and vehemently exclaimed you surely do not dare to say that after having kept me so long dangling in your train you intend to prove false to your promises now what promises you know well that after the last grand eclaircissement we had together it was formally settled that we were both free entirely released from our previous engagements so perhaps in words but not in reality think you i want to be taunted everywhere with having been jilted by you you can say you jilted me if you like it better and i will never contradict you tis no fault of mine that you have persistently followed my footsteps without receiving for months past any encouragement from me 
ah i would much rather be sneered at now than pitied later as a miserable wife you are growing sentimental and de montenay's lip curled tis not in your line miss de beauvoir and does not become you certainly not she retorted with an angry flash of her dark eyes nor is it in my line either to sit tamely down and listen to any one talking to me as you are daring to talk now ah what a happy couple we would make she sarcastically added our life one long unceasing warfare at least he interrupted we have the advantage of knowing each other's faults now instead of finding them out after marriage there will be no mutual accusations of deception in our case because we neither of us have self-command sufficient to conceal our faults was the retort our characters are too undisciplined for that this is childish trifling gertrude pray be reasonable and let us speak as sensible man and woman not like a pair of quarrelsome children i have given you my final definite answer i am sorry for your sake but no recriminations or entreaties will ever win another from me if such is really your determination you are a heartless unprincipled flirt no one knows better than yourself victor the injustice of that accusation have i ever pretended to feel love for you have i not rather by my persistent coldness plainly proved i entertained no such sentiment and have i not repeatedly endeavoured though always overruled to end this entanglement which was forced as it were on me when i was too young to decide on so important a point all nonsense miss de beauvoir retorted de montenay stung almost to madness by this frank avowal probably you have fallen in love with some more favoured individual than myself indeed i half suspected you of a fancy for that preux chevalier armand durand though apparently he has not reciprocated the sentiment how dare you forget yourself thus queried gertrude with flashing eyes why young people what is all this said the soft clear accents of mrs de beauvoir as she swept into the room her rich dress rustling with every movement i declare you are quarrelling with as much acrimony as if you were man and wife already that i fear we will never be rejoined de montenay sullenly at least if i am to trust the explanations which miss de beauvoir has just favoured me ah a lover's quarrel i see i must say you have had a fair proportion of them but courtship would really be insufferably insipid if not enlivened by something of the sort here the speaker carefully adjusted the cushions of the sofa on which she had seated herself casting however a quick covert glance in the direction of the belligerents tis more than a lover's quarrel mrs de beauvoir tis a formal intimation from your daughter that she will not fulfil our engagement that she definitely rejects my hand the elder lady's cheek reddened and her white fingers involuntarily tightened on the cushion tassel with which they were playing but with great outward calmness she replied and you really believe her victor ah tis her turn to-day it will be yours to-morrow to-night she will probably cry herself to sleep grieving over her folly and longing for the morrow to bring about a reconciliation gertrude's lip curled superciliously but she made no reply whilst de montenay taking his cap moodily rejoined i will say good evening ladies for i have borne as much to-night as i possibly could bear few men would have endured as much with this he abruptly left the room mrs de beauvoir waited till she heard him descend the stairs and the hall door close upon him then shutting the door of the drawing-room she approached her daughter and said do you tell me that you have actually refused de montenay yes mamma i have and why may i ask is he not good enough for a young lady eating the bread of charity fed clothed by her uncle's bounty 
gertrude's delicate cheek reddened for pride had a fair share of rule in that young heart and she impetuously answered yes i did refuse him and i would refuse him if i were begging from door to door from what novel is that taken or is it a flight of your own imagination please listen to me mamma i now formally confirm what i have just told de montenay never never will i be his wife but you have no alternative child you know as well as myself the struggling poverty from which your uncle de courval's generosity rescued us you cannot have forgotten the narrow shabby lodgings in quebec in which we were living after your father's death when his welcome letter arrived well did you find that life of privation so pleasant that you want to return to it there is no question of our doing so mamma uncle makes us welcome and he has ample means granted but he may die and he has other relatives who may confidently expect their share in his wealth another thing he may marry again and then what will become of us nothing for you but to go as a governess and for me perhaps to make handsome dress caps instead of wearing them gertrude you must forget this sudden madness that has taken possession of you and marry at once for i see in your case the proverb delays are dangerous is doubly true but mamma i cannot i will not do so and the little foot rapidly beat the ground oh if you knew how the schoolgirl feeling of admiration that i entertained for victor when i first came out in society soon gave way to indifference that has deepened in its turn to positive dislike gertrude i hitherto have stooped to reason and persuade now i will command listen child i enjoin you under pain of my severest displeasure to fulfil your early engagement with de montenay you will not surely set me at defiance mamma you have given me my own way so long that it will not do to tighten the reins so suddenly marry victor i never will so cease to worry me and let there be peace again between us god help me said mrs de beauvoir an inexpressible accent of bitterness piercing through the conventionality of tone and manner which until then had never varied i have brought up a daughter who forgetful of what she owes both to me and herself mocks at my counsels and laughs my authority to scorn a sudden feeling of remorse awoke in gertrude's breast for she saw her companion's emotion was sincere and throwing her arms round the latter's neck she whispered forgive me mamma i am so sorry for having grieved you thus prove it then by obeying me coldly rejoined mrs de beauvoir as she unwound her daughter's arms from her neck and left the room god help me too sobbed the impetuous girl as she flung herself in a paroxysm of passionate sobbing back in her chair worried tormented as i am on every side and my own undisciplined heart the cruelest tormentor of all Gertrude de beauvoir's nature was a noble and generous one but tares had grown up thickly in her impetuous character under the mismanagement and counsels of her shallow worldly mother and now the harvest time was an exceeding bitter one heartsick wretched she stole to her room and after long hours sobbed herself to sleep to awake next morning self-willed and imperious as ever End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Armand Durand by Rosanna Le Proen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The pleasant part of a Canadian autumn had come and gone. The gorgeous, many-tinted foliage had fallen leaf by leaf from the trees, leaving here and there a solitary brown speck clinging to some of the skeleton branches. 
its amber mellow sunshine had given place to the cold gray light and searching winds of dreary november and many a disconsolate pedestrian whilst surveying the seas of liquid mud flooding the city streets longed impatiently for a keen frost and deep snowfall which would bring the chief compensation the season could offer in return for the many discomforts of which it was so prodigal sitting writing by this dull november light in his little room at mrs martel's was armand durand very grave and thoughtful looked the young bridegroom of a few months and as he abruptly laid down his pen and rested his head on his hand a long sigh escaped him after a while he opened the plain wooden desk at which he was seated and took out a letter though the letter was dated a considerable time past and had evidently been often handled he read it slowly over it was from mrs ratel and had been written on her learning through some accidental channel the news of his marriage short and cold it began by regretting that her nephew should have shown so little respect to his father's memory as to marry almost immediately after his death and that too without even mentioning his intentions to any of the family then it deplored the singular and unwise choice he had made ah he had wounded tante ratelle in her weakest point there he who had received an education which fitted him to seek a lady a woman of intellect and birth for his wife and who instead had married a sewing girl it ended by a brief intimation that though she might consent to see himself in the future she had no wish whatever to make the acquaintance of his wife as may be supposed the study of this epistle did not tend in any degree to cheer the reader's spirits or to dispel a certain thin line of care beginning already to show itself legibly enough on his smooth forehead and after replacing it in his desk he returned to the brooding chain of thought to which it had been anything but an agreeable diversion the striking of the clock in the adjoining room heard easily through the thin partition suddenly roused him from his abstraction and he resumed his pen with a sudden eagerness that plainly denoted his intention of making up for lost time he had spent about a half hour thus when the door opened and his young wife entered she looked very beautiful and was dressed with a richness hitherto without precedent in that humble abode a costly silk elaborately trimmed a gold watch and chain with a couple of showy rings on her taper fingers presented a singular contrast to the simpler though graceful toilets in which we have first known her i want you to come out with me for a walk husband i fear i cannot go i must have all this writing done for to-morrow and though mr laez is kind he insists on punctuality that is only an excuse the real reason is that you don't wish to accompany me and why should i not want to go out with such a pretty little woman as yourself was the smiling query because i suppose you're ashamed of me ashamed of meeting any of those fine ladies and gentlemen at whose houses you used to visit before your marriage he gently laid his hand on hers and said delima you have already spoken in this manner two or three times and whilst assuring you of the injustice and folly of such an accusation i have also told you that it pained me but it is true she pouted none of them take the least notice of me though indeed i look as much of a lady in my new silk as any of them and though you used to be invited out everywhere last year since our marriage not one invitation has come for either of us too generous to point out to her that she herself was the cause of this universal neglect armand made no reply whilst she continued in the same complaining strain i'm sure when i married a gentleman a professional man i might say i thought i should be regarded and treated everywhere as a lady but you forget delima i am a poor man and poor men are little thought of by society you might be rich if you liked 
you have rich friends our hero hastily moved back his chair and she probably comprehending the meaning of that abrupt movement resumed of course you get into a passion if your poor wife dares to even open her lips on any subject save those which please you armand bit his lip and took up his pen which he had momentarily laid down ah i see you are tired of me you want me to go away i really think it would be the most prudent measure do you know little wife we are verging on a quarrel tis all your fault then was the feminine retort you get angry if i even speak to you for a moment the bridegroom's brow contracted but then as the ludicrous absurdity of the accusation struck him he smiled and said well have it so but since i am such a bear get out of my den quickly lest i should prove dangerous when i have finished my work i shall be entirely at your disposal but i want you to come out with me now she persisted again i tell you i cannot to-morrow afternoon we will have to ourselves but to-morrow afternoon i will not go and with a petulant toss of her head she flounced from the room armand sat motionless for some moments and then he murmured she was so gentle so timid so dove-like before marriage ah is he the only husband who has ever marvelled in a similar manner under similar circumstances he soon however turned to his papers and steadily worked on till summoned to supper the board was not as plentifully or daintily spread as in the days of his bachelorhood nor was mrs martel's countenance as serene and smiling the host alone was unchanged and with the good-natured politeness of former days he said as the young man took his seat mr armand try some of this hash perhaps it is better than it looks at any rate it is all i have to offer and it is as good as we can afford andre added his wife severely money is not found in the streets nowadays nor was it some months ago wife when we used to have a roast fowl or something as nice nearly every evening but thank providence i have a good appetite as well as good digestion so can eat what is going it's a pity you cannot boast also of having a little good sense was the sarcastic comment of his better half i have what is just as useful a fair share of good temper imperturbably rejoined the worthy mr martel armand my son pass me the bread you are not eating petite what is the matter perhaps you either cannot relish the hash it is not that indignantly interrupted the hostess no the poor child has been disappointed not in love at any rate was the smiling comment for she has friend armand secured hard and fast i wish cousin martel answered the young bride with a quick flash of her dark eyes i really wish that you would not drag my name into any vulgar jokes you are rather sharp to-night young woman you were not quite so short in past times because her patience andre has been sorely tried this evening waiting dressed in her best two or three hours for a walk with her husband and not able to get it oh is that all well she'll enjoy it all the more when she does get one brides are not usually refused such small requests replied mrs martel perhaps though it's the way with gentlemen and a sneering emphasis was laid on the latter word delima has married a poor man calmly spoke out the bridegroom she must take the consequences instead of walking with her to-day i had to write for all the money the writing brings in it might have been laid aside for a while but you have rich friends armand who could and would help you if your pride would only allow you to apply to them in that last sentence mrs martel had stated the unpardonable grievance that was at the bottom of most of the feminine persecution of which armand was the object i have already told you mrs martel that i would not allow any interference on that subject 
poor people should not be so finical and mrs martel stared at the clock as if addressing this observation specially to it you should remember you have a young wife dependent on you now here delima burst into tears whilst armand hastily rose from table and left the room i think you'll drive the nouveau marié into soon taking walks on his own account if you go on at him in this way he will find it the only means of securing a little peace andre martel you are an idiot perhaps so i married you but let us cease this sparring wife and give me another cup of tea as soon as he had swallowed it he unceremoniously rose and strolled into the kitchen for a smoke meanwhile armand started out on his unpremeditated walk and drearier weather fortune could not have favored him with the pleasant sunshine of the afternoon had early become overcast and now fast falling snow accompanied by a keen piercing wind rendered the streets shunned by all whom necessity did not force into them purposelessly he walked on no aim had he beyond passing away an hour and calming down the unusual irritation reigning in his breast past more than one brightly lighted house whose doors had till lately been hospitably opened to him he strode thinking bitterly of the many changes his marriage had brought him no invitations had he received since that eventful epoch from any of his former friends no calls had been made on his young bride no unceremonious visits paid himself in the evening except by l'esperance and a couple of his associates whose society he by no means desired for himself much less for delima of course the isolation that had fallen upon him was owing in great part to the obscure social position of the wife he had chosen and partly to some random insinuations carelessly mentioned by de montenay or mrs de beauvoir and subsequently circulated pretty freely of this latter fact he happily was unaware for he had subject enough for bitter thought already leaving the thoroughfares he turned down one of the narrow dark streets leading to the harbour the latter presented a lonely desolate look the black expanse of water dark wharves covered with snow whilst two or three spectral-looking crafts oyster or wood bateaux the last visitors of the port shone dimly through the faint uncertain light a lamp gleamed dimly here and there through the thickly falling snow and against the post of one of these he leaned for a long time absorbed in thought as dreary as the scene around him at length yielding to a growing feeling of physical discomfort he turned his steps homeward though not late when he arrived there he found the lights and fires out and the door fastened mrs martel and delima having retired early so as to execute this small vengeance as he knocked softly at the door he inwardly thought how pleasant it would be if his young wife came down and with a kind word or smile admitted him how willingly then would he overlook the annoyances and discomforts of that evening a light gleamed suddenly inside the house and the bolt was withdrawn but it was by the worthy host himself poor armand you must be very cold why you are wet through and through sit down and i'll light up a fire to warm you you needn't say no because if i don't you'll be sick to-morrow you are shivering now first carefully closing the door of the staircase leading to the upper part of the house he stirred the smouldering fire in the stove into a cheerful blaze and filled the kettle this done he proceeded to place on the table bread and cold meat with tumblers and a bottle armand you took no supper this evening so you must make a hearty one now and a glass of something warm will keep you from taking cold after your lonesome walk ah my young friend you must not let these matrimonial squabbles cast you down 
of course they're unpleasant at first but when one gets used to them they find that they simply mean nothing besides there's always some compensation if a wife is a scold she is probably a clever housekeeper if niggardly and fond of stinting one's comforts she is certain to be saving and economical young durand shook his head i do not find the compensation a sufficient one in either case perhaps neither do i but where is the use of grumbling at destiny to be sure some men reverse this rule and manage to have all the faults on their side the endurance on the woman's but they must have strong wills and rough tempers of their own i hate quarrelling with women said armand abruptly so do i was the quiet answer and in consequence mrs martel rules the roast to be sure i tell her a piece of my mind now and then but it does neither good nor harm taken all in all she is a smart careful wife keeps my house and clothes in excellent order whilst as to her tongue i mind it no more than the singing of the canary hanging over your head try friend armand to follow my example and you will be all the happier for it the prospect thus held out to the young bridegroom was anything but a very enlivening one and he inwardly wondered that runaway husbands were not more common however he was young blessed with a tolerably good constitution and appetite so he addressed himself without farther delay to the comforts martel had so kindly provided for him and found that they at least dispelled his sensations of intense physical discomfort though they could do nothing for the dull pain wearing at his heart calm brooded over the cottage for some days after this but on one occasion that mrs martel and delima had been out together shopping andre saw at once by the menacing brow of his spouse as she re-entered the house that the truce was at an end armand who had been detained at the office did not come in till late and seeing that his smiling salutation to his young wife was coldly received he seated himself awaiting though not with martel's philosophical calmness the coming storm i should like to have a new dress armand suddenly said the bride in a pettish tone but you have one on you already that becomes you charmingly i do not ask for compliments tis money i want alas i have none to give you see one of the many disadvantages of being married to a poor man but in case i should find a purse or come into a fortune what sort of a dress is it that you want a purple silk with a satin stripe i saw one on a lady to-day yes and a real bold one she was too interrupted mrs martel to see the haughty way she sailed in as if she was a queen and cast a look at delima and me as if we were beggars and delima by far the prettiest of the two who was this bold lady in the purple silk with a satin stripe questioned armand laughingly as he helped himself to a piece of toast one who used to know you well enough though she is too proud to know your wife and delima slightly tossed her head miss de beauvoir the sound of the name that had been a spell to him through his boyhood and beyond it brought a flush to his cheek which his female companions were not slow in noting ah if you had married the young lady whose name causes you to blush so charmingly you would not have refused her a paltry silk dress was mrs martel's sarcastic comment thoroughly roused armand retorted if i could not have given it to her she could have done without it for she does not require such extraneous aids to make her look like a lady armand in saying this had indeed sprung a mine under his feet the effect of which he was destined to expiate in many a subsequent domestic feud its present result was to call forth an hysterical sob from delima and an energetic denunciation from mrs martel among which confusion he hastily rose and retreated to that usual haven of refuge his room 
this is to last through sickness and health till death do us part he wearily sighed and she is only seventeen i but two and twenty very dreary was the maze of thought into which he plunged and long he remained absorbed in it careless indeed unconscious that he was in darkness and that notwithstanding the severity of that sharp winter night no fire crackled and sparkled in the small stove that stood in his room suddenly the door was thrown open and the hostess after uttering the one word mr belfond placed a candlestick on the table and hastily retired closing the door with startling violence for a moment the two friends a prey to mutual embarrassment silently confronted each other then belfond recovering himself extended his hand and seizing armand's in a tight pressure exclaimed well old friend it is time to wish you joy but i have been out of town since your marriage and only arrived yesterday poor uncle toussaint is now in a better world i hope than this here durand noticed for the first time that his friend was in deep mourning and his generosity to myself deserved all the attention and affection i could show him i need not ask if you are well and happy bridegrooms should always be so of course armand replied in the affirmative and endeavoured to look as blissful as it was reasonable to expect from him under the circumstances but his careworn haggard face did not escape the quick eyes of his friend who had had moreover a foreshadowing of the truth in the momentary interview he had just held with the bride the retiring gentle modesty which had once distinguished her and which he had so much admired had given place to a vulgar ostentation of dress a ridiculous self-assertion of look and manner which amazed as well as disgusted belfond and prepared him for the gravity of the error his unlucky friend had made in his choice of a wife after a time seeing that the bridegroom seemed unwilling to speak he gaily touched on his own affairs you must know armand that with the exception of the few weeks of poor uncle toussaint's illness during which time i got a little repose mother sisters and cousins have been and are still continually importuning me to do what you have spontaneously done and get married destiny though is against it i see a young lady take a fancy to her and congratulate myself that there is a prospect of being able to fulfil the wishes of my friends for i never intend to marry without love bien entendu but before myself and the object of my worship have met five or six times my flame begins to burn dimly and at the end of a dozen interviews it is entirely extinguished i am sure there are very few nice girls in society with whom i have not been deeply in love for a time and yet i think i would rather be hanged to-morrow than marry any of them come advise me what to do there was a momentary pause durand evidently seeking for an answer when the voice of mrs martel plainly audible through the thin partition exclaimed in reply probably to some suggestion of her husband's fire indeed no we cannot afford to indulge in such wasteful habits if they are cold let them come out and sit here i suppose we are good enough company for them this tirade was too loudly uttered for belfond to affect unconsciousness of it and looking earnestly in armand's face which expressed so plainly the mortification and pain the bridegroom felt whispered my poor friend rodolphe belfond however was not one to give way long to sadness and suddenly snatching up armand's cap he placed it on his head saying and now for a walk then a cosy oyster supper at oars over which we can discuss our mutual grievances armand made no opposition and as the two friends passed out arm in arm mrs martel with a shrill voice and still shriller laugh said it is teaching a husband bad ways mr belfond to be taking him from his young wife 
the way then madame martel is for the young wife to render his home so happy that it will be impossible to coax her partner away from it and with this telling rejoinder to the elder lady and a gay deferential bow to the bride who sat pouting near the window he drew the door behind him i would give much armand to be in your place for a month that i might have the taming of that old shrew i think my hates would prove stronger and more lasting than my loves i cannot endure quarrelling with women said armand wearily i am not so squeamish and would enjoy a bout with that old virago as much as i used to relish a set to in our college days i would show no quarter to her age or sex i assure you after the two friends were comfortably seated at their oysters in a pleasant warm room armand began to open his heart a little to his companion he hurried over the incidents of his father's death suppressing in great part the tale of paul's treachery and then though with considerable reluctance mentioned the circumstances connected with his marriage belfond saw at once how completely his friend had been duped but he made no comments while the latter went on to explain that he continued in compliance with his aunt's earnest desire to draw the yearly interest of the legacy left her by his father unluckily he had once mentioned to his wife mrs ratel's proposal to put him in possession of the whole sum at once and this circumstance was a constantly recurring cause of the bickerings which embittered his domestic life both mrs martel and delima continually but vainly urged him to endeavour to induce mrs ratel to renew her first proposal for armand knew that such a request would be unwelcome in the present state of things as tante francoise would naturally be averse to placing the sum she had destined for assisting him in his legal studies and starting him in life at the discretion of a thoughtless young girl who might spend it on ribbons or fine furniture then paul shortly after his brother's marriage had written him a few friendly lines begging him to accept a couple hundred pounds as his wedding gift this epistle armand had briefly redirected back to his brother but unfortunately delima had previously seen it on his desk and it afforded fresh scope for angry remonstrance and fretful repining from the moment of that discovery mrs martel and his young wife gave him but little rest or peace had money really been a thing utterly unattainable his life would have been much easier and his female friends would have been satisfied with things as they were but the idea that he could command eight hundred dollars if not more by a mere scratch of his pen as they phrased it a sum fabulous in its amount to them representing elegant toilets parties of pleasure new furniture for the little sitting-room and many other things equally attractive and yet obstinately refused to employ so precious a prerogative was unbearable when durand had concluded his confidences a pause followed which belfond at length broke by saying women are unintelligible and unmanageable look at that gertrude de beauvoir after flirting with de montenay and keeping him dangling after her ever since he left college she gave him an unqualified dismissal the other day why inquired armand in a low voice for a woman's weightiest reason the utter absence of one mrs de beauvoir was bemoaning her daughter's infatuation and obstinacy the other day to my mother in the most pathetic terms and deploring the loss of what she styles such an excellent match but to return to your own affairs now or never dear armand let me enjoy the privilege of a real friend and see how i can help you you know poor uncle toussaint has left me ample means the entire control of which i possess myself and joyfully do i place whatever you may require of them at your disposal armand shook his head if my pride would have allowed me to accept of your generously proffered help 
i would not have spoken to you so openly of all my troubles no rodolphe true kind friend but do not look so chagrined i promise that if i should ever be driven to apply to a friend to you shall my application be made it was late when they rose to separate and as armand softly knocked for admittance he anxiously remembered that he had never returned yet at so late an hour to his home as usual it was his landlord who let him in and in a somewhat hesitating voice he asked whether he required anything instead of the supper from which the tongues of his fair companions had driven him on armand's answering in the negative he seemed much relieved and muttered something about the women being unusually out of sorts mrs martel having taken the mean revenge of locking up the bottle however he added i'll buy another one to-morrow and put it into a new hiding-place so we will checkmate her famously as the young man with a friendly good-night was retiring to his room his companion laid his hand impressively on his shoulder and said one piece of advice friend armand that i will not cease repeating to you till you act on it is this don't let scolding drive you from your meals eat well and heartily then beat a retreat as quickly as you like this counsel was certainly given in time for next morning at breakfast mrs martel and delima launched forth into sharp innuendos and irritating reflections concerning the neglect and heartless indifference of some men who preferred a drinking bout with a boon companion to the society of their respectable wives instead of acting on his host's judicious advice and taking a full meal armand hurried off after half rations of tea and toast to what he had once laughingly styled a dingy office dungeon but which was now a haven of refuge a welcome asylum of rest End of chapter fourteen